5,000, 4,000, 3,000, 2,000, 1,000. It is Wednesday, 6 p.m. UK, and we are live. We haven't got our regular Atwood Unleashed show today. We have got a special Q&A with John Sutton. Tons of people watched his video overnight. It's got 20 plus thousand views. And I'm sure some of you have got some questions. All of John's links will be in the description box below this video. I urge people to subscribe to his channel. And also to check his book out. His book just come out. It's already got 11 reviews. It's 4.9 stars on Amazon. It's called HMP Manchester Prison Officer. I survived terrorist murders, rapists, and Freemason officer attacks in strange ways and wormwood scrubs. It's book one of a series. And the audio book should be out quite soon as well. So, huge thank you to the people in the live chat right now. And huge thank you to John for coming on. John, just assuming that some of the viewers haven't seen your story before, just by way of introduction, while we get the questions collated, are you okay just to give a, a, a general introduction, a summary of your story and your interaction with the Freemasons, etc.? Certainly, yeah. I started uh, work at Strangeways in January of 1975 and uh, subsequently went to the training school at Ley Hill, which is in the Midlands down near Bristol, actually. And uh, from there, I was posted to Wormwood Scrubs. Uh, Wormwood Scrubs is a, a massive great prison in London, as people will probably know, located on Duquesne Road. And uh, I was uh, one of the landing officers on C2 Landing, which was at the time the biggest landing of prisoners in Europe, over 200 inmates on one landing. And uh, from there, I, I managed to get myself into quite a, a great deal of hot water with various uh, various issues with the... I, 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 they were actually the Masonic people who were running it. You know, we had people like uh, governors who were helping themselves to uh, inmates you know, sexually abusing inmates. We had uh, prison chaplains who were taking the younger boys and persuading them to dress up as choir boys and interfering with them. Uh, there was uh, a great deal of abuse. And when I reported this, I, I was astonished to find that not only did the authorities not want to hear my reports, but uh, I started to get retribution. When I reported one uh, senior governor, the chief officer said, on what authority are you investigating senior members of staff? I said, well, uh, you know, I'm according to my warrant, I've got all the powers of a police officer and I am required to do my duty and this man is abusing inmates. Oh, no, he's not. Who told you that? I said, well, I've investigated it. And I gave him the proof. And uh, subsequently, the police were called in. And you would believe, probably, that the police would come in and investigate my complaint. No. They came in and investigated me, <laughs> which which uh, not only astonished me, but it, uh, it, it astounded the inmates who, who were working, who were on the landing I was working on, on, on C2 landing. They were trying, I don't know quite what they were expecting to get, because I, I wasn't corrupt in any way. I was actually, I'm, I mistakenly believed that that was the job I was employed to do. And uh, obviously I was wrong because what happened was uh, that they were looking for a, an excuse to charge me with some offence and I would have been uh, before the courts. Eventually I did end up before the courts because I'm sure it was the, uh, the Brotherhood that sent out people to attack me because I was physically attacked on a number of occasions. And on one occasion, three rather large men came at me in a public house and said they were going to kill me brandishing glasses in their hands and walking across and when they got within about 18 inches of me i terminated the action well you've got to, you've got to do something haven't you <laughs> <laughs> you can't i mean it's no good allowing yourself to get hit with a glass and then say oh look what's done i wasn't going to do that so 
put it bluntly, I just put the first one asleep and the other two, it, 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 they, they hit them so fast, they were on the floor. <laughs> and the, the next thing, the next thing was an ambulance called and carried them away. I, I, the police said that I had uh, assaulted them. I said, well, what, what could I do? You know, I couldn't get out the pub. I was in a corner. I was having a, a quiet drink with my friend after a day working at the scrubs. And three blokes attacked you. You'd defend yourself, wouldn't you? So it, it kind of went downhill after that. You know, I ended up in Knightsbridge Crown Court. I mean, it astounded me. And the thing was, I couldn't get legal aid. They didn't let me have legal aid. They said, "Oh no, you. This is uh, you. 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 You've decided you're going to Crown Court." Well, of course I was. I wasn't guilty. You see. So basically, what what they did was, uh, I had to pay for all my own defence, and it cost me thousands of pounds. I mean, I joined the prison service to be a tough guy. I joined the service to look after my wife and myself. And I am mistakenly believed that this was a career. I mean, it, it did say in the advertisement, you know, join the modern prison service. <laughs> so when I joined, when I went into Wormwood Scrubs, they'd got paraffin lamps, that's tramps, and they were being hosed down by fire hoses. You know, people covered in excrement and dripping with urine being hosed down by fire hoses, you know. I mean, this is the modern prison service, yeah? I mean, you, you didn't have time to do anything other than bang them up and slop them out, and the jailers on the landings treated them like they were the enemy. I mean, how could you possibly rehabilitate somebody who you regard as being the foe? Well, I didn't, but that was the general uh, attitude at the scrubs. So from the scrubs, I'm, I was virtually thrown out and uh, went to Strange Ways. <clears throat> and at Strange Ways, it was the same old story. You know, the staff were brutalising the inmates. There was a great deal of racism. It was run by people who were in, not only in the Masons, but in the National Front. The, the chairman of the Prison Officers Association was the chairman of the Northwest branch of the, of the National Front. I mean, uh, uh, he said he wasn't a racist. I mean, goodness me, what is the National Front if it's not racist? Yeah? He, he was obviously deranged, you know? But, I mean, and he was also a principal officer. And mixed up in all this, you've got the governor who was an ex-military uh, officer who, who was absolutely as mad as a nat, Norman Brown, absolutely infamous. You know, and he said, you know, the, the, everything that happens in strange ways stays in strange ways because you will not discuss it. You know, I mean, I, I didn't believe this, you know, so I said, sob this. We'll get a proper trade union because the, the Prison Officers Association got chief officers in it, you know, principal officers, <clears throat> and they were trying to discipline me, you know. If my trade union, so who do I go to? I can't go to anybody else if they're in my trade union. So I said, we'll have a proper trade union. So I started one. <clears throat> I had uh, friends who were solicitors, and we drafted up uh, all, all the documentation, and we got it certified by, I think, called the certification office. Now, the certification office, you can apply and you pay a fee, and they assess whether or not you're an independent trade union. And if you are, you get a certificate of independence, which we got. And I was the elected general secretary except the Prison Officers Association didn't like this because they said they were the only trade union that represented prison officers. But they represented the management. They were a tool of management. The Prison Officers Association were the management. So that was the problem. And I, I, I decided to take them on. Unfortunately, they, they controlled virtually everything. They had the governor in their hand and uh, the authorities, all the, all the major staff were part of the system and they told everybody that I was a member of Colonel Gaddafi's Revolutionary Army which is ridiculous I mean I had been in Libya I'd been in Libya but I was trapped in the middle of the Sahara Desert you know surrounded by Colonel Gaddafi's army who was shooting bullets over my head but I certainly wasn't going to help Colonel Gaddafi but they just did that to frighten the staff <laughs> Yeah, so that, that's that, that's where I'm coming from. 
All right, so we've got a couple of other people in the chat now. Loads of questions have come in. Huge thank you to everyone for logging into this live Q&A with John Sutton. If you didn't see John's podcast, it went out last night. It's got 20,000 views overnight. And he was attacked by Freemason officers as a prison officer himself. Ex-military, he stood his ground. And that just caused more consternation and more attacks. He was in fear of his life. Imagine if your life depends on your fellow officers backing you up in hostile, dangerous situations and environments, and those guys are out to get you killed. That is the kind of crazy situation that John Sutton was in. And his book's just come out on Amazon, HMP, Manchester Prison Officer. Link is in the description. All right, so the first question that's come in is from A Nexus, John what attracted you to a career as a prison guard? I didn't know attracted to it at all. I, I wanted to be a police officer like my father, but I was colourblind. I didn't know I was colourblind until I took the uh, the medical. I passed the exams, went for the medical, and they said, no, you, you're colourblind, you can't join. So I thought, well, I'll join the fire brigade. So I went to the fire brigade, same thing, passed the exam. I think, no, couldn't join because uh, I was colourblind. So I didn't have to be half colour sight to join the prison service. So I joined the prison service and they advertised it as a career. I'd basically come out of the army and needed a proper job to support my wife and myself. And uh, to me, the, they advertised the prison service as being a proper career. At the time, believe this or not, a prison officer was paid more than a police constable. So I was quite happy to join that. I believed it was going to be a proper career. It was only when I got the uniform on that I realised there were a bunch of raving maniacs. So <laughs> seriously, uh, so I, I didn't actually desire to be a prison guard. I had been, believe it or not, a, a prison guard in the army. I, I was the regimental box middleweight boxing champion, and they put me in charge of the jail in the in the army. I don't know why they did that. They must have seen something about me, you know. That this guy. So anyway, I did it, but I was always benevolent and tried to treat the prisoners because I knew what they were. They were just soldiers like me, and 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 they were they were there for a very short period of time. So I used to just say to them, "Listen, forget this. In a couple of years, you'll look back and laugh. But in the meantime, you know, I'll play the part of being a right bastard NCO." <laughs> And, and you can play the part of being the prisoner. So I used to shout at them all. I said, mate, it was only a joke to me. And then when we had finished it, now I said, right, lads, cup of tea and a game of cards. <laughs> so they, they, they didn't feel bad about being a, a prisoner. You know, they felt that they were going to get out of there and they'd be back to being, because oh, the, when they got out, they'd wave to me out in the guard house. You know? <laughs> I, I imagine the sergeant major thought, what the hell's going on here? You know? Because <clears throat> I didn't let them know what, that I was being being reasonable with them. Yeah, so that's why I, that's how I ended up being a jailer. All right, so Lance Smith wants to know if you've got any Paul Sykes stories. For the viewers who are not familiar with Paul Sykes, we have interviewed Jamie Boyle, who's written several books about Paul Sykes. There's audio books available. I've listened to them. They're fantastic. And Sykes got up to some really uh, insane behavior and insane stories, but he was also a bit of a boogeyman in the prison system. There's rumours that he was put in cells with younger prisoners who wouldn't behave themselves. And he would do, um, I'm trying to phrase this carefully, he would do naughty, un uncouth things with them. Is that, is that were they just rumours, John, or was that, that, that correct? Yeah, that's pretty well correct. He, he didn't do it on his own. He had a, a couple of people helping him whose names we shall not disclose. <clears throat> but he was certainly notorious at Strange Ways <clears throat> for, shall we say, buggering young inmates, but not, not boys. You know, they had to be over the age of 21. But he was also a, a thug and a bully. And uh, he, he actually tried it on with the staff. The first time I met Paul Sykes, he, was, he had his head on the floor held down by a couple of big burly jailers, and I was injecting him with uh, chlorpromazine or Largactyl, which uh, he quietened down after that. And was he quite a big fellow? He was big. He was about 6'3", 6'4", about 17 stone. 
he could throw his weight around, but after he got his ass full of lager, actually, he was staggering about a bit, you know. Gaz Smiths sent the next question. Thank you, Gaz. John, did you manage to get any corrupt Freemasonic prison officers to end up actually doing time in the prison, or were, or were there any consequences for these Freemason officers that, are, that are set you up to be assaulted and stuff? Well, the guy who, uh, one of them who eventually attacked me, I managed to get him prosecuted at the uh, magistrate's court, and uh, he got a suspended sentence and fined at uh, Acton Magistrate's Court in 1976, 77, that, that time. But uh, generally speaking, they were protected. You know, you made a com you made a written complaint about what was happening. You know, like the governor who was uh, associating with one of the Category A inmates, I made formal complaints about him. I ended up getting investigated by the police myself. Didn't prosecute him. Although I have to say that following my written submission, he wasn't seen in the prison again. So somebody moved him. But where he went, they didn't say anything to me. Uh, I uh, reported uh, a, a senior member of the clergy who was going into the cells on a Saturday mornings and uh, persuading the inmates to uh, fillet him. That's a technical term for sucking his knob. But... <laughs> <laughs> seriously and uh all i got for that was threatened by the chief office <laughs> get out of my office <laughs> with the great big bastards yeah so they, they, they would not you can understand how how jimmy savile got away with it because as soon as you make the report all hell breaks loose but it is not at the person you've reported it's you that catches him the person who's blowing the whistle because these people are connected and they're protected. So the, Maso I... the Masonic system protects itself. Chris Miller, you mentioned earlier, John, that you were attracted by the wage, but Chris Miller specifically wants to know what was the wage in the 1970s and 1980s for a prison officer? Well, <clears throat> as I say, when I started, I was being paid more than a, a police constable. But basically, the, the wage was, uh, in those days, I mean, we, you've got to remember, we're going back to 1975. It was about 35, 40 pounds a week. That's what the staff got. But uh, within a period of three years of me joining the prison service, I, I was earning about 120 pounds a week. That was in the uh, mid-70s. And uh, that was with overtime, of course. So the problem was that the overtime was compulsory because the Prison Officers Association, who represented the management, by the way, had decided with the management that they were going to make it impossible for staff to work the standard shift system. You actually worked, and if you got the, said, dedicate the weekend off, oh no, they could call you in and require you to work. I did see them about this. They said, that's the decision we've made. We've agreed with the governor that you'll work compulsory overtime, so thank you very much. It wasn't to my benefit, was it? <laughs> Next question is from A Nexus. With all of the dysfunction in the prison service, how did you cope, John? Well, I had been uh, in the army. I, I'd done a number of serious courses in the army. I did the parachute course. I trained with the SAS. I did a, a winter warfare course with the SAS. Believe this or not, absolutely true. They took you to the top of a mountain in the Hartz Mountains in Germany, right on the border with Russia, and they took you up to the top of the mountain and left you there. And their idea of the winter survival course was if you survived, you passed. <laughs> Seriously, it was that bad. I mean, I, I had people with me who, who feigned illness, pretended that they had heart attacks, threw themselves on the floor. There was about 120 of us at the start of this course. At the end of us, there was 15. And, and the SAS, who were walking around, it was minus 20 in shirt sleeve order. That's the shirts rolled up, open-necked, you know, bare-chested. Eh? And they say, well, right, we're going to see you a lot in three months. I thought, you won't bloody see me in three months, lads. I'm off. <laughs> <laughs> I never went back. You know, so I've been all through all that. So what the prison service had to offer, uh, it wasn't as mad as that. It was dangerous, and there were some very nasty criminals. But I tell you what, there weren't a patch on the staff. The staff were ten times worse. <laughs> so we've had a prison governor, Holly, on the channel recently, and she's become very popular. 
And Terry Murphy is wondering if you would do a joint podcast with Holly. Terry believes this would be a good interview and will probably bring more out of the conversation. I don't know this lady. I mean, I haven't read any of her books or anything. I don't know who she is. But my experience of prison governors is that if you are the prison governor, then you've got some authority. If you're an assistant governor or a deputy governor, then basically you're in the shadow of the boss. And that's what you do. But I don't know if they were effectual. To me, they seem very ineffectual. So Holly is working on her book and... I will send you the links to her videos so you can see what, she, what, what she's like. So Carl's question is, John, is rehabilitation a reality in prison? Well, it depends which prison. I mean, there is a prison called Grendon Underwood where they really do attempt to rehabilitate people. There was an inmate from uh, Grendon Underwood called Mark Leach, Anybody who's interested in prison systems will have heard of Mark Leach. He wrote the prison's handbook, and he was a former inmate of Grendon Underwood, but he was diagnosed as being an untreatable psychopath. And I worked with Mark Leach when he came out of Grendon Underwood to help him get a publisher for his book. And uh, he is an extremely intelligent man. But people often say, who is the most dangerous inmate you ever met? And that was it. Mark Leach, he wouldn't attack you, he'd sue you to death. And he actually prosecuted the Home Office 50 times and never lost. Took wow. them to court. But rehabilitation, yeah, in prison, but certainly not in somewhere like Wormwood Scrubs, not, not in uh, strange ways. They couldn't give a flying one. And the staff actually were against the education department. They treated them with great hostility. On a number of occasions, I took inmates who I thought would benefit from being in the in the uh, education departments with them, and uh, they were absolutely astonished to see an officer come in. You know what are you doing here? They were frightened them. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I'm serious. I think this guy needs help. You know, whoa. Yeah. So yeah, but the rehabilitation basically, the staff couldn't. They couldn't get one. No. Um, just to clarify, there's a bit of confusion in the chat. People have heard you on Spotify today, and they think this is not live. There's two parts of this. We put out John Sutton's podcast yesterday. It is on Spotify today. That is correct. But this is a second part. This is a live q and I assure you. It's 20 past 6 p.m. UK. <laughs> so stay tuned. <laughs> I'm definitely, I certainly was last time I checked my pulse anyway. <laughs> All right. So, Mr. North, there are loads of Masonic officers in prison when I was in. We questioned their tattoos, but they always dismissed them as something they're not. Now, John, is that something that these Masonic officers have? Is a certain type of tattoo? Do you know, I can't say I've never seen <clears throat> a Masonic tattoo. I don't know what one would be. Would it be the square and the what? I, I don't know. I mean, I haven't got any tattoos. I don't know that Masons would have it. I mean, all the Masons that I knew were considered themselves to be uh, beyond anything like that. I mean, but they did have funny handshakes and some of them wore Masonic rings and certain symbols that they would pass. But I never saw any tattoos, no. Do you remember the what the rings looked like and what manner of handshakes they were? Yeah, they they, they pressed the thumb into the uh, lower part of your uh, finger. Press the thumb to the lower part of your finger. Yeah, the thumb. They pressed the thumb in there and uh, also making signs like this, you know, like three fingers or else pointing their fingers down. Yeah. The, the little finger down. So they do have little signs. The, the three, the sign of three is th 33rd, the three degrees of masonry. Wow. And then on the rings, was it the all-seeing eye or anything? No, it wasn't the all-seeing eye. It was the set square and the compass. Ah. On the ring. Indian Martial Arts Research Group has asked, why would Freemasons want to work as prison officers? Well, I mean, basically, they're guaranteed that they're going up the ladder. And uh, back in the seventies, it was uh, you were you were getting a proper pension at the end of it. And uh, if you got up to being like a chief officer or a governor, 
then you were actually going to retire on a reasonable amount of money. And uh, whilst it wasn't going to be uh, an exhilarating career, it was safe. And, and, and if you're working in, in the system, don't forget, the Masons are, have got to protect them. They protect themselves all the way through. Masons in the police, Masons in the judiciary, M Masons in the prisons. That's how it works. The system, they've got it sewn up. Um, did you know? So if you've joined the chat, please put your questions for John in the chat. We've got loads of them come in, and we will get to all of them. And the next one is from Gaz. Is the prison system still infiltrated by Freemason officers in the present day? I can't believe that it's not. It, it absolutely will be because the, the fact is that they've got to maintain a, de a degree of control all the way through society because that's how it works. I mean, the system operates on the idea that Masons, Freemasons can actually get through the system without coming unstuck. I mean, as I said earlier, people like Jimmy Saddle, I imagine having the keys to Broadmoor and being able to uh, access the morgue where you can have uh, sexual intercourse with dead bodies, and you're allowed to do this. How are you allowed to do it? Who allowed that? And there the, the must have been people like myself who saw this and reported it. But what would happen to them is they get dismissed or put on the most terrible duties so that nobody ever did it again. It would just shut them up. Seriously. Bay State Traders wants to know how long the drug that was injected into Paul Sykes lasted. Paul Sykes, when he was injected, it, it, the, the actual effects of chlorpromazine or Largactyl in the, in the backside up the jacks, yeah, that definitely put you out for two days following wow. that following that you would be on the uh, liquid the liquid kosh that means you would take like 10 10 mils of, of liquid largactyl morning noon and night a different strength 50 50 milligrams or whatever yeah depending on what the doctor described it wasn't at the discretion of the hospital staff it was strictly by order of the doctors but believe me that's what the doctors did. All right. So Ben has asked whether there were female guards where you worked, and if so, did they have relations with the inmates, sexual relations with the inmates? There were no female guards when I was there. It was absolutely 100% male, no female guards at all. Uh, I did uh, work at Style for a period of time where there were female but they were guarding females i mean the idea that they put female guards into male prisons is ridiculous to me because they are not going to be able to handle a big angry man so in that respect all they're doing is taking up uh, the place of somebody who may be able to help you in the event of trouble and they are obviously going to be manipulated by the inmates and no look at the papers time after time you see uh, female prison officers who have been exploited by inmates to bring in drugs, bring in telephones, whatever else they're bringing in. And uh, basically they're being used. And that's, that's what I mean. Some of these late females, they actually believe these who are very sophisticated inmates, by the way, they believe that they love them. Oh, he loves me. He's not really that bad. Believe me, they're bad bastards in there. You've got to be extremely cautious. You've got to have a very strong mental outlook if you're going to work in the prisons. And if you haven't, then it won't be long before you're running bets, bringing in whiskey, or bending over the desk. I have seen some of what John <laughs> just described in terms of people manipulating female staff members by expressing false feelings and also getting pen pals and then going all the way to marrying them to get them to smuggle drugs in. So I can confirm that all that stuff does indeed go on. So Rebecca Nickel has asked, does John think the problems he experienced are isolated in the prison service or is it a wider problem in the British establishment? Well, it is part of the establishment. That's what prisons are for. The big prisons, we're talking things like Armley Jail, Wormwood Scrubs, Pentonville, Wandsworth, 
Strange Ways, HMP Birmingham. They were all, you look at the dates they were built, they were all built to look like intimidating castles, gothic horror things in the, the, the very beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And that was when the agricultural population was coming into the cities to work in the factories. And they were there to intimidate the working class. Today, the, the systems in the prison, I mean, you're locking people up for not paying television fees. If you're not paying your TV license, you can be locked up. Uh, if, you, if you're not paying fines, you, you can get locked up. I saw uh, an elderly gentleman, it would be about 70, who was imprisoned for walking his dog in a park in Burnley. And he said, I've been doing this for 50 years. I don't see any reason why I should stop just because they've passed a bylaw. But the magistrates fined him. He refused to pay the fine. And he ended up in Strange Ways Prison. And he'd never had an offence in his whole life. He was about 70 years old. And you'd think the staff would be sympathetic, wouldn't you? The actual staff started barking at him. Seriously, everywhere he went, they were going, woof, woof. Uh, he lasted two days. He paid his fine. <laughs> Poor bastard. I felt sorry for him. So is it endemic in society, you ask? It's right through society. It's everywhere you go. The people at the top, or the people who are getting towards the top, are... Members of the of the of the brotherhood or members of the cult, and I believe that they're con. Well, I know that they're the ones that control. I'll tell you a story here. My father was a police inspector, and uh, he had a friend who was an also a police police inspector. And they said, he said to him, "Why don't to my dad? Why don't you come and join the Masons?" He said, "That's a guarantee. You'll get all the way to the top." And my father was a Roman Catholic. You see, a practicing Roman Catholic. I'm not, by the way, but he was. So he went to see the priest and he told him what had been asked, you know, suggested that he join the, the Freemasons. And the priest said, you can't do that. It's against the teachings of the Catholic Church. So my father declined to join the Freemasons. His friend, who was a Freemason, ended up as a chief constable. That's how it, that's how it works. <laughs> yeah. So, the same in the judiciary. The same in the judiciary. I knew somebody who went before the judiciary, charged with grievous bodily harm, made all the signs, let the, let the judge know that he was a mason. Case the, the, the judge said, I've looked at this. He said, I'm not going to try this case. Case dismissed. That was it. So I'm with John Sutton on the live today. It's a Q&A. Put your questions in the chat. John was attacked by Freemason prison officers during his career, and his life was put on the line by them. Former military, he stood up for himself, and on and on and on and on it, on it went. And the whole story is in his book, HMP, Manchester Prison Officer, available worldwide on Amazon. Dan Westy wants to know, John, did you come across any prisoners who were Freemasons? Yeah, well, there was a prisoner who was a Freemason, but... Uh... He was it was a strange character. His name was Terry Sinclair. He was a, an international drug smuggler, and the, the people may remember the, the handless corpse, where they cut the hands off the corpse and threw them into uh, a thing called Ekidelf, which is like a a big quarry full of water. And uh, subsequently, scuba divers who were practicing diving got down to the bottom and there were these bodies on the bottom <laughs> with their hands cut off. Mm. And uh, that was uh, part of Terry Sinclair's gang that did that. And he ended up in strange ways and he was definitely a Freemason. And he was offering a million pounds to anybody who would get him out. Anybody. I'll tell you a story about Terry Sinclair. Uh, he was moved from strange ways to uh, Winston Green in the Birmingham, HMP Birmingham, and he was found dead in his cell at four o'clock in the morning by the chief medical officer, the chief officer and the governor, all, found, all three of them in the prison at four o'clock in the morning. Now, anybody who's been in a British prison will tell you there's no way. You, I mean, I couldn't even get a, a doctor at four o'clock in the morning, never mind a senior medical officer, you know. <laughs> So I was this, and subsequently 
he was cremated within about three days. <laughs> Terry Sinclair, yeah, gone, De dead, <laughs> cremated. And here's another story. I had a big house in Manchester, and in the house I had a bar and a, and a, a disco and all that. So I had a party one night, and my brother brought one of his friends who was a solicitor in Manchester, and uh, I was talking to him about strange ways, and he said, oh, do you know Terry Sinclair? I said, yeah, I know him, yeah. I said, he was down the block, you know. He said, I said, but he's dead now, isn't he? He said, well, let me tell you this. If he's dead, I want to know how he's dead, because I'm his solicitor. He said, and nobody's told me. <laughs> <laughs> and he was handling all his affairs, international affairs. You know, he owned property in New Zealand, in Australia. He had houses in Miami, and I oh, was multi-millionaire. You know what it's like, Sean. You've been there. <laughs> so do you think that he knew too much about these powerful people? He, yeah, well, he knew, but I believe that uh, he must have done a deal with them. But he was definitely a mason. All right, you've kind of covered this one, but I'll just read it to you and get any further thoughts. Seagull Guitarist has asked... Do you think Freemasons in the police force is commonplace all over the UK, or is this just isolated to some prisons? Well, Freemasons are, are throughout society. You've got Masonic lodges all through the country. I mean, there are different levels of, of Freemasonry. I am not a Freemason. I have, I have attended Freemason events, but I am not a Freemason. I, w I wouldn't join it because it's a science society they say it's a society with secrets that's what they say but to me it's a secret society and if i need a secret society to get on with my life then there's something wrong with me but there isn't i don't know i seriously don't believe that but they are they are throughout society and they don't joke about it i mean they do a lot of good work but believe me that is a facade yeah that is the mask Behind that, there is a very sinister movement that controls a lot of what happens in this in this society. And uh, I have a cousin who's a senior mason in Canada, but he doesn't speak to me. But he, but he is, yeah, seriously, yeah. So I believe it, it is throughout the society, throughout society. You've piqued our curiosity, though, John, by saying you have attended some free masonic events. What yeah. was the nature of these events? Uh, I believe they were trying to kind of recruit because they probably thought if we can't beat him, you know, take him in, you know, get me, you know, I'll be one of the boys, but I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. What, what, when you say event though, what do you mean? It was uh, like an evening, you know, where you go and meet the boys. Yeah, yeah. Then, then they decide if they want to see, but I never went back. And when you met the boys, could you describe what you saw? Yeah, they were basically they were, I would say, affable middle class individuals. The majority of them were people who worked in business. Now, I mean, I assume that, that the idea of that was like a business club, so that you scratch my back, I scratch yours, that kind of thing. But don't forget, if you've got police officers and prison off senior police officers, senior police officers. And, and this and senior council officials and all the rest of it in the same club, then it's wide open to corruption. And that is basically how it works. So we've got a question from Jane Kennedy. She wants to know if the Freemasonic officers who attacked you are still alive. Well, uh, the, the, they'll be old now. I mean, come on, I'm 73. I mean, the senior officers that were behind the assaults on me would be in their 40s, 50s when it was being perpetrated against me. And the people that came out to do the actual physical attacking, they were just cannon fodder. So I don't think that they'll be alive now. Bloody hell. Okay. A question's, come, a question's come in from me, which I can answer real quickly. He's just asked for my opinion on Brian. I assume he means True Geordie. So I did an almost one-hour video on Brian True Geordie yesterday, so I'll refer you to that. Presently, we are doing a Q&A with John Sutton. HMP Manchester Prison Officer is the name of his book. Worldwide on Amazon right now, it is available. If you do have any questions for him, if you saw his podcast yesterday, 20,000 people watched it overnight. And he was attacked by Freemason prison officers. And he stood up for himself. 
and it was an ongoing drama and his life was on the line. All right, so next question then. It's from Gaz Smith. Did you work at Risley near Warrington and was this Masonic thing happening there? Yeah, the Masonic thing's happening all over the place. I know Risley. I mean, Risley was known as Grizzly Risley. Yeah, have you heard that? Anybody heard that? <laughs> because of the number of suicides oh, at Risley. Uh, people hanging themselves in the cells. So I, I do know Risley. It's not far away from where I used to live, actually. But uh, the the Masons were there, but I don't actually didn't actually work in Risley. But it's throughout the system. They get people into positions of authority so that in the event that you as a, a Mason need their help, they're there. Jane's question is, are these enemies still not stalking you? Uh, it's quite possible, but I mean, I have been relatively quiescent for the last 20, 30 years. It's only uh, in the last 12 months that I've started to speak out again. And that started with a guy called Neil Samworth, who came to see me and asked me to do an interview. And I did. And uh, he introduced me to Jamie Boyle and Jamie Boyle introduced me to Sean Atwood. And here I am. But it's not something I'm... Uh, I don't believe that I'm being stalked at the moment, although I do have uh, a, a lot of troubles happening now and again. So I have been over the years, yes. So John has his own YouTube channel. I urge people to subscribe to it. John, what made you start a YouTube channel? And as you're talking about these things on your channel, are anyone is anyone rising up against you? People are making uh, comments, but they're not exactly attacking me. I mean, people are making, I mean, I just believe it because they don't actually know. I mean, I had comments uh, yesterday saying, oh, that was rather naive and prison officers do not have the powers of a police officer. But the Prison Act awards all prison officers with uh, their authority of a police constable whilst they're acting as such. So when you're on duty, you have all the powers of a police. You see, the problem is, the authorities don't want you to do that. They want you to be uh, a turnkey. So they don't exactly empower you to do it. But they can't take that away from you because it's in, it's something that you're handed to when you join the job by the government through the, an act of parliament. So, yes, that, that, that you do have that power. Gigi Wilson has asked, is prison officer corruption widespread? Oh, yeah, well, I believe so, yeah. I was at uh, Strange Ways, and uh, one of the inmates offered me a bribe. And uh, so he said, uh, I, I want a different cellmate. I said, well, why should I do that? You know, I said, just get, I'm busy, you know, leave me alone. Oh, no, he said, uh, I, he said, I'll make it worth your while. So he offered, said to me, if you go to a certain club, I believe it was the 007 in Blackpool, I don't know if it's there now, but it was owned by Brian London at the time. And this guy was uh, the head bouncer for the club. He said, just go there and mention my name. He said, you can have women, drink, anything you want. He said, all I want you to do is to get me a, another different cellmate. He said, and I'll tell you who it is. I said, well, this sounds a bit dangerous to me. You know, I mean, if I do that, what happens if I get found out? He said, no, you won't get found out. He said, the loads of staff have done it. I said, ah can't believe that oh yeah he said such a body has done it such a body done it. Oh. so you give me a list about three or three or four senior members of staff so i went to see them one at a time and i said uh, i've just been offered a bribe by this inmate told him who it was he said he's given me your name said that you've been on the take you know when you've been to this club whoa i said anyway it's going to take me about half an hour to write my report I said, which I'm going to give to the governor. I said, so whatever you've got to say, you know, you've got half an hour to say it. You know, so I, I wrote the report, went to see the chief officer, and it in. And uh, you would have thought that they would have taken some retribution against the inmate, but they didn't. They didn't. They, they, they moved him the following day to uh, an open prison near Blackpool. I mean, he dropped the jackpot there, you know. <laughs> And the people, the staff, they never said anything to him, as far as I know. Yeah. Lord, Lord Darnley has asked whether you encountered any famous people inside the prison. Of course I have. I mean, I mean, it depends what you call famous or infamous, yeah? Uh, one of the first, what you'd call famous, was Leslie Grantham. 
Leslie Graham, that rings a bell. Dirty Den from EastEnders. He was at uh, Wormwood Scrubs. I was was that, was that, wasn't he alleged did a murder or something? He did He did murder somebody in Germany, yeah. I was on D-Wing and uh, Leslie Grantham saw I was wearing army boots, you see, because comfortable army boots, or they were. And it, uh, he came up and said, the army boots, boss. I said, yeah. He said, were you in? I said, told him I was in Germany. And then he gave me this sub story about how he'd accidentally shot this taxi driver when he was in Germany and he was serving life and he wanted to get out and be an actor, you know. And so I was talking to Leslie Grantham and subsequently he got out and he did get a job acting and he was on uh, EastEnders for quite a lot of dirty then, if you if you watch that kind of stuff. <laughs> I, grew up, I grew up watching that. Did he expand on that and tell you how he came to accidentally shoot somebody? I think he was just trying to say, make an excuse that he didn't intend to to, to kill the man and that it, the gun went off accidentally. But, I mean, if you go out with a gun in your pocket and you kill somebody, you know, you're a murderer, aren't you? Whether it's accidentally or not, you've gone armed. And that's what he did. I mean, he was obviously trying to rob the uh, the taxi driver. But the problem is, in Germany, you didn't get a lot of money, you know, when you were in the army. So you had to make a decision what you were going to do. Me, I just read books. Any other famous people? Any serial killers? Well, uh, there's all the serial killers. I mean, one of the nastiest ones I met was the Black Panther, Dennis Nielsen, who was uh, in, in strange ways. He murdered Leslie Whittle, didn't he? And uh, he shot quite a few uh, sub-postmasters. <clears throat> he was robbing post offices in. And then he captured uh, Leslie Whittle and tied her up in a drain. And he was in strange ways and really weird guy. Uh, I went down to take his medication one day and he was sit doing sit-ups, press-ups, step-ups, running on the spot. And this was about quarter past seven in the morning. Then I went back at dinner time to give him his dinner medication. Still doing it, sit-ups, press-ups, back at tea time, still all day, non-stop. He was mad as a nut. He died in prison anyway. It didn't do him any good, did it? <laughs> so that, that was another one of the serial killers, yeah. Mm, but Ian Brady was probably the, the most notorious of, all, of them all. And there's uh, quite a few connections with Ian Brady and myself. How my, come? Father, my father was one of the CID officers that uh, was at his trial and arrested him. Him and uh, Superintendent Joe Mouncey who used to come to our house. And uh, when he was uh, in in the scrubs, I was locking him up in the scrubs. And uh, one day, the senior officer, it was lunchtime, the senior officer said to me, there's a man coming in here. He said, you will not see him. You will not look at him. You will not go anywhere near this man. When he's in there, he's going to see Ian Brady. He says, you will stay out of the way. So all right, I'm not in charge here, you know. I mean, I'm just the get. I'm just on patrol, you know. So I did what he said. But the guy who came in was immaculately dressed, really smartly dressed. You know, a thousand pound suit in them days, really nice, you know. Uh, and he was a great big fella. And uh, he went in to see Ian Brady, immaculate. Came out. His tie was all over the place. His shirt was undone. His jacket was half hanging off. He was sweating. What the hell had he been up to? Eh? Anyway, uh, he went out, but Ian Brady he wouldn't speak to staff. He wouldn't speak to the screws, you know, he wouldn't. He only spoke to the governors. And he was a horrible, nasty bastard. I mean, you looked at him and he looked, there was like an aura around him. Dark, yes, nasty, horrible, evil little bastard. Yeah. Callum wants to know, were there any moments as a guard where you stuck up for prisoners? Any moments that you feel proud of today? I feel sad about a lot of them, I tell you. There was, in fact, I've just been writing about one. One, one uh, big black inmate, uh, it wasn't his fault. He was ill and he was on the sick parade. And uh, the, the hospital officer who was in charge of the clinic, it wasn't me, uh, was shouting abuse. And he shouted something at this guy, something really obnoxious. And uh, the guy just got up and smacked him straight in the mouth. And he and I had to. T I, I didn't jump on him. I just said, "Right, come with me." And I took him down the block. 
But as soon as I got him down the block, Bootsy and the and the and the gang at the block grabbed hold of him, whipped him into a cell, and all the all the clothes torn off. And I felt sorry for him. But when I had to go before the man, before the court the following morning with the Norman Brown, who was the governor, I actually gave evidence. I'd written the evidence out. So when I went in the next day, they handed me my statement, except it wasn't my statement. <laughs> It wasn't my statement. Somebody else had written it. So I said, read that. So I read it, and at the end of it, I said, I'd like to add, you know, that uh, the reason that this happened was because hospital officers, such and such a body, you know, actually started shouting abuse and called him this very bad name, you know. And, said, and, the, and the governor looked at Norman Brown, looked up to me like this, his glasses up and said, I just didn't hear that last part, Mr. Sutton. Thank you very much. Oh, God. Like a boss has asked, do you think people now tend to keep their mouths shut over things they've seen or heard as they know what will happen? Well, let me tell you, like a boss, if they've got any sense, they will. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, if, you, if you start to speak out, then they are going to get you. Believe me, it took a while for me. I was assaulted numerous times and uh, eventually they did get me. And it was blatantly obvious that I'd been assaulted. People witnessed me being attacked, but they, the this, the man who made the assaults, didn't get reprimanded. He was he, he he ended up as being the chief nursing officer for the entire northwest of Britain. And at the time he attacked me, he was a, a senior officer, which is just one rank above mine. Peter wants to know if you've heard of a prisoner called Warren Warren and also who the hardest prisoner you've ever come across is. The hardest prisoner would absolutely be Frankie Fraser. I mean, you couldn't hurt him, you know. He'd been flogged twice. I mean, that's using the, use the cat and nine tails, yeah? Yeah, and, and they'd use that twice on Frankie Fraser. He'd been on the roof at... Uh, uh, at various prisons on the roof, yeah? Now, if you've ever been on the roof of a prison, I've been on the roof of uh, at the top of Strangeways and at the Scrubs, and it's bloody cold up there, believe me. <laughs> yeah? It is freezing. Mm -hmm. You've been up there, you've got to be tough to stay up there for a, a day or two, and he stayed up there for a few more than a few days. Uh, and you, you'd you be pointless hitting him because uh, to, to hit somebody like Frankie Fraser, you're just going to make him angry. He wasn't big enough to attack you from the front. Frankie Fraser was notorious for attacking from the back. And he injured a number of staff. He injured one officer at Durham by striking him at the back of the head with a, a metal chair and he blinded the man. It destroyed his optic nerve. So that was the hardest man. A number of really tough prisoners, but basically, I've, I mean, I've been all around the system and at strange ways... I never saw one inmate win, ever. No matter who they were, they get them down the block. And if, if they kick up down the block after they'd had a beating, they send for the hospital staff. And you go down with a syringe full of chlorpromazine or Largact or whatever, the staff hold them down and you inject them. And believe me, you're quiet after that. Don't care who you are. It, it's a no-win situation. So, Alicia... Thank you for the super sticker um, chat. Appreciate that in the chat. And Jane wants to know about any paranormal activity involved in your attacks. Well, there's not a lot of paranormal. I mean, I am a sen I am sen personally believe that I know that I'm sensitive, you see. But I was at the scrubs and it was a C2 landing. It was one lunchtime and I heard this tremendous banging on, on the door, one of the inmates banging on the door. So I went forward, unlocked him, and they jumped out. And as they jumped out of the cell, these inmates, the furniture was still moving around the floor. And one of the inmates threw himself on the floor and he was like having a fit. And I said to them, what the hell's going on here? He said, oh, we, we've made, we made a homemade Ouija board, yeah? And we've been using this in the cell. He said, and all of a sudden, the, 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 the furniture started to lift up, move around the room, a great big wind came, and then 
I said, no wonder, you know, <laughs> that you've done this. And the inmate on the floor, we had to get the hospital staff, take him away, and he was hospitalised. You know, put him in a padded cell. He got mad. <laughs> what the hell he'd experienced, you know. And that was just one instance, you know. D-Wing was haunted at the Scrubs, D D4. I was on there one night. I mean, if you've never been in a prison on your own at night, at midnight, it is bloody scary. I tell you, freezing cold, all everybody's banged up. It's supposedly dead silent, except every now and again, you can hear people walking around. What the hell are Who the hell are they? <laughs> <laughs> you can't see them. You know? <laughs> It would, be about, it would be about quarter past midnight, and this prisoner was banging on his door. So I went up to eat, uh, see him. Where was it? D4, yeah. And right at the end, he was banging on his door. So I, when I opened him up, I opened his spy all up, looked in and said, what's going on? He said, there's a, a lady on my bed talking to me. I said, no, there's no ladies in here. You know, this is not, this is the male prison, you know. You'd be on. It took me about half an hour to calm him down, you know. <laughs> anyway. I wrote this up in the incident book, and the following morning, the uh, senior officer came around and said, why have you been missing uh, this clocking on mechanism, you know? I said, well, it's in the incident book. You know, I went to this. He said there was an Im a, w a woman on his bed, and he, he said, where was it? So I told him where it was. Oh, I said, that's possible. He said, it's been seen a few times. Apparently, before the Second World War, Wormwood Scrubs was used as a female prison part of it, and there'd been an inmate in that cell and they'd taken a baby off her when she had a baby, taken the baby off her, and she couldn't stand this and threw herself off the fourth landing right there and, and landed on the on the base dead. And she, that was her cell, you see. So had she been there with him? He certainly oh. didn't. So. I, that, I tell you, that was spooky working on that wing, I tell you. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, numerous and, and the, of course, strange ways he's haunted by the ghost of James Ellis, the hangman. More on that in a bit, eh? Wow, what a chilling story. Um, Gaz wants to know if you'd ever worked with Neil Samworth. No, Neil Samworth joined the prison service 20 years after I left. I mean, I left in 1985, and Neil Samworth joined round about 2005, I believe. Red Man wants to know if you ever came across Maudsley in the prison system. Uh, the name kind of rings a bell, but I, don't, uh, I can't absolutely say that I did. I mean, who is Maudsley? Uh, I think he's a famous killer that other podcast guests have really? told, told us stories about. He's in a, like a glass cage now, I believe. He killed, if, if, I'm on, if this is the right guy, I think he killed a, a few prisoners as well, told the guards there's going to be a couple shot for the head counts. Yeah. Um, thankfully <laughs> so Lach Empire wants to know if there's any records of prisoners claiming to have been taken by aliens, alien abduction not that I know of Not that I, can't, I can't say that I know of anything to do with aliens in the prisons at all uh, certainly I do believe in aliens I mean, it, it, you look at the universe, you know, it's absolutely, it's impossible that we are alone. But uh, I certainly haven't any records or met anybody that claimed that they'd been abducted from prison by aliens. It would be a wonderful excuse for absenting yourself from strange ways. <laughs> Gaz, um, question for you, Sean. Did you come across anything like this in the US? So because I was at the convict side of things, I probably wouldn't have been able to ascertain about memberships of secret societies and how they integrated with the prison guards, the unions, that kind of thing. So I, it may well have been going on, but I wouldn't have been aware of it. Um, you're getting asked here, John, about John's cousin escorted Myra Hindley onto Saddleworth Moor. What, what's the story there? Yeah, no, that's my brother, Martin. Brother. Yeah, my brother Martin Sutton, he was a detective inspector with the Greater Manchester Police and they took Myra Hindley out of uh, prison and uh, took her up to the uh, moors to see if she could identify where the, where the, where the body was. 
that, that, that they couldn't find and uh, she couldn't find it. Uh, he was taken up there. There's a, a video clip of him with uh, Chief Superintendent Topping and uh, my brother, Detective Inspector Sutton, uh, taking him, taking Myra Hindley up to the moors. Yeah. Wow. Ronald wants to know if you ever came across Charles Bronson. I haven't personally met Charles Bronson, no, but uh, we do have a connection. In uh, the 8th of June, 1990, I wrote an article for The Guardian called Loose Screws. Uh, and uh, when it was published, apparently Charles Bronson got a copy and put it on his uh, the wall of his cell. And he was dancing around his cell, taking the piss out of the jailers. Because I was just, in, in the article, I was talking about the informal control system. And uh, that's what Charles Bronson was complaining about half the time. Yeah, so that's the only connection I have with Charles Bronson. Western Loomis wants to know, what's the worst abuse you ever saw a prison officer commit against a prisoner? Oh, I... I actually did see one maniac prison officer at the scrubs pretending to hang somebody, but he, he didn't actually do it. You know, the, the, rope, the rope wasn't attached, although the prisoner didn't know this. You know, he just put this bit of rope through the, uh, the top and put it round his neck, then kicked the chair away from him. He fell on the floor. But, I mean, that was disgraceful kind of power. Per position to do it that's horrible that but i mean the pissing in the soup was fairly regular i mean if you think that's an abuse i mean but I, would they know i mean i i said to this guy who did it in front of me unzip todge it out piss in the soup put it back up i said well, what on earth are you doing this for he said to me that'll teach the bastards <laughs> what would it teach him they didn't even know I couldn't understand it. I actually said to the chief, to the senior officer, I said, are you aware of what's going on here? He said to me, you get about your duties. <laughs> In other words, yeah. So, so I had actually saw this. You know, this is absolutely unbelievable, this. There was an inmate on D1 landing who was mentally disturbed. He was. He was, he was not well. And uh, he complained to the psychiatrist that he was seeing yellow mice, green mice, polka dot coloured mice, white painted in his cell. And then the psychiatrist was going to certify him. In fact, he did certify him. But it turned out that the staff had got some paint from the art class and they were capturing mice and painting them and putting them in his cell. I mean, <laughs> how bloody cruel is that? This poor bastard's off, off to Broadmoor. <laughs> Crazy. Um, Lack Empire wants to know what you think of prisoners learning psychic powers. Well, I mean, good luck to them. Yeah, it won't do them any good. <laughs> you know, I mean, where do they learn it? I mean, you can get books on develop your psychic. In fact, I used to teach that, but uh, it's not going to do them any good. I mean, basically, you can get out of prison. I think it was Nelson Mandela that said uh, to the guards, "You think you you think I'm in prison? You're in prison." Not me. So I'm, I I go into my and he gets in a trance, and out he goes. He can go anywhere. So Nelson Mandela did practice that what transcendental meditation. Yeah. A Nexus wants to know if prisons get crazier during a full moon. Well, there's a theory of that, you know, that, that that they do, but I honestly can't say that I had noticed that. Certainly, there are times of the year when prisons are crazy. That would usually be around Christmas time and New Year and things like that. They go crazy then, but not necessarily with a full moon, no. JC wants to know, what was your favourite moment as a guard? I can I remember home office that was telling me I was going to be medically discharged. That was definitely the fav my favourite day as a guard. <laughs> <laughs> Never have to go back. <laughs> Weston wants to know were drugs an issue in the prisons during your time there and if so which drugs did they use not really no the, the tobacco was the currency when I was there in the 70s and early 80s 
there weren't really that many drugs around. I mean, it was only subsequent to that that they started to get things like speed and spice and whatever it is. But when I was there, it was mainly uh, tobacco, although we did have people who managed to get alcohol in and uh, they did try and make their own alcohol. At the scrubs, they made some alcohol, believe this or not, from Brasso. You know what they used to polish metal? They, they poured it through a loaf, yeah, and, and uh, a loaf of bread, and uh, what came out of the bottom was pure alcohol, and uh, the inmates drank that, and it, a number of them went made blind. It was poison. I mean, you wouldn't do it, would you? So one of my podcast guests is a guy called Yami B, and he went on to start his own YouTube channel. He's one of my favorite guests. He's such a good guy. And he's JC is wondering if you ever came across Yami B. Oh, looks like we've had a freeze frame situation with John's Wi-Fi. Well, it's a huge thank you for all the questions so far that have come in. You've really kept this going. We've done an hour. So if John does not materialize anytime soon, I might just end it here. I'll give him, I'll give him a couple of minutes to try and get back on. And in the meantime, we've got Michael Thompson, podcast four coming out tomorrow founder of the California Aryan Brotherhood, who was shot 22 times and served 45 years. And then we've got a Q&A with Michael Thompson coming on Sunday night at 6 with Bruno, who served time with me in the Arizona prison system. So if you've got any questions for Michael Thompson, please join us. And John has rematerialized. Here he is. Yeah, I know what happened there. So the last question, John, there's a guy called Yami B. He was one of my podcast guests. Great guy. Always got a positive aura about him. One of my favorite guests. And JC wants to know if you ever encountered him in the prison system. His name's Samson. No, I can't say I did. I mean, don't forget, I, I left in 1985, so it's a long time ago. It is, isn't it? All right, the next guest wants to know if you had any contact with the Birmingham Six or the Guildford Four or the IRA. Oh, I'm connected with the IRA and the, some of the Birmingham Six were in uh, Wormwood Scrubs. And uh, the IRA, they used to say things to you like, uh, we know where you live, you bastard. You know, I mean, I don't do them any harm. But when I was at the Scrubs, I was given a detail to search the IRA cell one day. And uh, I went to the cell and I said to the guy, I'm going to search his cell, you know. And uh, he wouldn't he wouldn't cooperate. He, he said, no, you're not going to search my cell. So I just grabbed hold of him, you know. I mean, the thing is, if you're sent to do the job, then you've really got to, you got to do the job because I didn't really know who he was, only subsequently. Uh, so, but when I grabbed hold of him, the, 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 the staff from D1 came and got me off, you know, get off him, you know, you're not doing that. I said, I'm going to search his cell. Oh, no, no, you're not. And the staff from D1 threw D wing at the scrubs, threw me off, off the, out of the wing. Subsequently, about a week, 10 days later, there was a demonstration at the scrubs on the roof of D wing with the IRA. And this guy was one of them. And if they'd let me search his cell, then they'd have found all the things that he had, like a, a, an Irish flag and pretend uniforms and berets, and they made it all up, you know. But that's why they wouldn't let me search his cell, you see, because I would have found it. You talked about Frankie Fraser earlier, another character from that era, Charlie Richardson. Did you ever meet him, and was he as devious and dangerous as they say? Uh, Charlie Richardson was in Wandsworth. He, he wasn't in the scrubs, but I believe he was dangerous. And uh, Frankie Fraser was, was just a torturer, you know. He, uh, he wasn't really what you'd call a hitman. He wouldn't uh, get a gun and go and do you. They used to nail them down for the Richardson gang, nail people to the floor of these uh, London warehouses, and uh, then 
they get Frankie Fraser in with a blowtorch and he tortured them and ripped their teeth out with a set of pliers. But he was a psychopath, was Fraser. Didn't have any feelings, no, no empathy. You know, if somebody would say to me, you know, we'll give you a thousand pounds, pull all this bloke's teeth out. I couldn't do it. You know, I couldn't just do that. But he didn't think anything about it. Certainly, out they come. Um, <laughs> JC wants to know what your opinion is on the effects of the abuse by guards of putting prisoners in solitary confinement for too long. Well, we're talking about this as being an abuse, but if we go back to the 1850s when they built Pentonville, it was built on what's known as the separate system or the silent system. And that was standard practice for the entire prison. They didn't allow any inmates to converse with each other, and they were all separate. There are uh, paintings and drawings of Pentonville in the 1850s where you can see all the inmates in the chapel, and they all had separate little pews, and there, were, there was wood at the side of them so they couldn't converse with each other. So it, it, it's been built into the system right from the start of the big penal system, which, as I previously said, was part of the uh, system of the Industrial Revolution to control the working class in that you'll do what we say or else you're going to end up in one of these terrible Gothic horror museums like Strange Ways. But, uh, yeah, I believe that uh, putting people into solitary confinement destroys their ability to think straight and you start to hallucinate. Uh, it's an it's absolutely an abuse. So Lack Empire wants to know whether secret agencies are doing experiments in prisons on prisoners. Have you ever seen the film Clockwork Orange? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, in the film Clockwork Orange, uh, they do an experiment on him where they sit him into uh, a chair and show him uh, visions of people being tortured and war and sexual images and uh, then they feed him drugs exactly that at the scrubs i was at the scrubs in when i was in 75 and uh, they have a unit or they had a unit in the scrubs where they had like it looked like a dentist chair but you were strapped into the chair they put electrodes on your head and then they showed you uh, films and they and they read your brain waves to ascertain exactly what perversions you were, you know, what happened. And then they gave you drugs to counteract this. So that was an experiment at the scrubs. I sat in the chair and did it, but I didn't take the drugs, you see. But seriously, this maniac who was running it, he looked like the guy out of, see the guy from Back to the Future, yeah, with, with the mad hair and, yeah, it looked like, like him. And, and I'd been in this chair and shown all these horrible images with the electrodes on my head. And he said to me, uh, Mr. Sutton, he said, we've looked at your, you looked at your charts. He said, have you ever thought that you could be homosexual? I thought, I am getting out of here. <laughs> <laughs> um, just to add on to that then, so we interviewed a guy called Posh Pete and he got in trouble for cocaine in Ecuador. And big pharmaceutical companies were experimenting on the prisoners there and he has still got i think it's bovine tb to this day which has put him in a his body in a very bad state of repair it's one of the saddest chapters of his book because he, he survives this horrible prison where people are getting murdered all around him and it's the bloody medical experiments that get him in the end and in the america you know where i was housed i did research and you know found out that over the years all kinds of things had gone on with the medical companies and prisoners and prisoners selling them blood and lots of the prisoners blood ended up with uh, hepatitis in it and and it was sold all over the world and people yeah. to this day are still dying because of this tainted blood that was sold all around the world so they definitely try and milk the prison population from whatever angles they can milk them. And um, next question, are English prisons as corrupt as American prisons? Um, John, you just already said they're quite corrupt. So I think corruption, it's just part of human nature, isn't it, John, corruption? 
Well, it is. I mean, the problem is that the, the, the paying the prison staff very poor wages. I mean, in London, I mean, 35,000, 30,000 a year in London, you won't be able to rent a flat. Uh, you won't. It's just insufficient. And if you're working at the Scrubs or Wandsworth or Pentonville and, and uh, you're getting, I don't know, £2,000 a month and somebody offers you £1,000 to bring in... Uh, a little parcel of drugs. I mean, the temptation is there. If, if the government want to wake up to this, if they paid the prison staff properly and made it a worthwhile career, then they wouldn't get that. And they cut out they cut out a great deal of problems that exist within the prison system. Yeah, we interviewed Lee Davies, ex-prison officer. He said his starting salary was £18,000, which is approximately $22,000. And the gangs ended up offering him five hundred pounds to bring packages in, and he could bring up to three packages a day. So look at the amount of money he could make from the black market on drug smuggling versus what he was getting offered as a guard. It's a there's an economic incentive to be corrupt. There is. I mean, I didn't join the prison service to make a load of money. I joined the prison service to have sufficient money to look after my wife and family. So. Two other, other guys who I've published books for are Ian Blink MacDonald and Paul Ferris out of Scotland. And Gaz is wondering, John, whether you ever came across them or, the, or were they before your time? Oh, yeah. You after were before my, their time. After my time, probably. I've, got, I've heard of Paul Ferris, but I don't actually know them. No, I do not. I never came across them. All right, like a boss wants to know, do you remember, John, 1999 Strangeways G-Wing around end of August, September? Lad was out in about two, three weeks and about to be married. He never got out. He was beaten to death by the guards and they hanged him. Right. Heard of that one? I haven't heard of that one, but, I mean, the idea that prison staff are going to hang people, I mean, as I say, the only hanging asshole was just a, it was a, some kind of cruel joke at, at, at Wormwood Scrubs. But the idea that prison staff would do that, I mean, can you imagine they're risking their own lives themselves? Why would they want to do that? I mean, there are some staff that are completely uh, out their head with violence, and they like that. But to take it, I've never seen anything where, they, where they've actually hung inmates. I've seen them get beaten, and I've intervened, you know, to stop staff from beating inmates and actually ended up being threatened myself. But uh, certainly I've never seen anybody... Uh, taken to that extreme, no. Well, we've got a, a question that ties in with that. Benny wants to know, would it be easy for a government assassin to whack a prisoner in the UK system? So for some kind of assassination to be co coordinated? Yeah, um, of course it would. I mean, all they do is get, to get sued up. And there are undercover police officers in the prisons, but you don't know who they are. They, you're never told who they are, but they do exist. And I know that they exist because uh, I was uh, doing a, a law, law degree course and uh, one of the uh, other students was a chief inspector with the Greater Manchester Police. And uh, he said to me, he said, because uh, we knew each other, you know, and he knew my brother, you know, because they're both in the team together and he said you do know that we're watching you don't you i said well what are you watching me for you know he said well he said i'll tell you he said i shouldn't do he said but i'm attached to mi5 he said and you've got a file he said because of what you've been doing with the with this trade union and going around talking to people you know so i got a file at mi5 uh you can imagine that they were they were tapping my phone seriously and my wife saying i can hear the phone going click 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 I said, well, what are you saying? She was just talking about which nappies she was <laughs> for our daughter, you know. So that's all the MI5 got out of my phone. Western <laughs> Loomis wants to know, do you remember dealing with any prisoners who you believe were demonically possessed or who were the eeriest prisoners? Well, there was one particular inmate that I believed was possessed. And uh, this was quite early in my career at the Scrubs. And uh, he was known, or the press had given him a name. They called him the Soho Vampire. Oh, yeah, the Soho Vampire. Didn't he and, end up attacking you? 
he ended well. He, uh, I'm sure that the staff did it to me deliberately. They got me to put handcuffs on him and take him to the movies on one Saturday afternoon. And the film that they were showing was Tales from the Crypt. <laughs> and it was about vampires. And we got halfway through this film about people being having the blood on it. And the, the Soho vampire who's handcuffed to me starts howling like a bloody wolf, jumping up and down and trying to... Um, he was trying to get his teeth in there. I, I don't usually do this, but I hit him right in the bloody face. And piss off. <laughs> It took some getting out, you know, and I'm sure he was possessed because he was not normal. That is it, you know. What what um what did the Soho vampire actually do to be in prison? Oh, he was uh, he murdered a couple of prostitutes and drunk the blood because when oh, they found shit. Him, yeah, so I think he was completely mad, you know. Wow. I met the Cambridge rapist. He was another nutcase. And what he, was your interaction with him? He was on C two landing actually, and. Uh, Cambridge was about five foot four, but extremely muscular build. You know, he'd probably be about 14 stone, but really a bit like uh, Mick McManus, if anybody's ever seen the wrestling things where he was a wrestler. He was built like a wrestler. And uh, one day I opened his cell and he, he came out stark naked, except for this shirt, this dress that he'd made himself. It was a converted bed sheet with paint that he put all over it jumped out, he got this enormous great erection and he said, he'd, kiss me Mr Sutton, kiss me, tried to grab hold of me, I thought, bollocks to that, I'm not being raped by the Cambridge rapist uh, I, I grabbed hold of him and ran him into the side of the cell and threw it out everywhere I went after that all around the jail, they shouted kiss me Mr <laughs> bollocks to that I, I survived the Cambridge rapist yeah Ronald was Ronald wants to know, John, how different would things have been if there were cameras back then? There were certainly no cameras, yeah. I mean, from my experience of the staff is that I found a way around them, you know, because if they were determined to do what they were going to do, then they would have done it anyway. But, uh, yeah, there were no cameras then. There were cameras, listen to this as a story. At the side of Wormwood Scrubs on the wall, there were cameras. And the cameras were there to make sure, you know, that nobody got over the wall. Or nobody did what they did with Ronnie Biggs. That's pull a big van up to the side of the wall and get a ladder up. That's what they did with Ronnie Biggs. So the cameras were there to make sure they didn't do that. But opposite the Scrubs, D-Wing, opposite was Artillery Road. And next to Artillery Road was Hammersmith Hospital. Now, Hammersmith Hospital, the actual building of Hammersmith Hospital next to the prison, was the nurses' quarters. So the staff who were operating the cameras used to swing the cameras round so they could zoom right in on the nurses' quarters. And believe it or not, I was on D D4 one night, and this evening, about half past eight, this inmate said, come and have a look at this, boss. So I knew the inmate, you know, so he knew he wasn't going to jump me or anything. So I shot the boat on the door, went in. He said, what do you, I said, what is it you show me? He said, stand on there and have a look out. He says, it's about four in from the light. So I jumped on thing and I looked across. And I could see the nurses' quarters. And there, there was a, about four in was this worse. So lights all on, full belt. Yeah, she's ironing away, stark bollock naked. A big blonde lady, perfectly natural blonde as well. Seriously. They were doing this to wind the inmates up, I think, you know. I mean, but the staff on the, on the security units, they got their cameras trained on them. Yeah, forget the security, we're watching the nurses. A Nexus wants to know if tattooing was big in the prisons by the 1980s. Tattooing, yeah. I mean, if anybody remembers the Borstal system, I don't think it exists now. But the, the sign for the Borstal boy was, have you ever seen this, the, the image for the saint, which like a stick man, yeah, with, with, a, with a halo at the top? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, 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 that was the, the on the on the hand, yeah, on, on the wrist, just above right. the wrist, yeah. And that was the sign for the Borstal boys. They had that tattooed on. They did it in the cells, you know, with ink and a pen, a pin, you know. And uh, I saw one inmate who'd have a homemade tattoo and uh, it said, believe this or not, all across his forehead, it said Elvis. 
<laughs> well, they, always, yeah. but they all made tattoos. They looked absolutely horrible, you know. And once you've done that, you you're kind of scarred for life, aren't you? Ben wants to know whether you witnessed any murders with your own eyes while at work. I, I saw a few deaths, you know, and people who were being uh, lacerated, you know, but uh, I didn't exactly see anybody murdered on the spot, you know, otherwise I would have done my best to intervene, you know. But you've but, actually uh, watched people die. Oh, I had to do that, yeah. I mean, I went to one incident at the Scrubs and... Uh, this guy was banging on the door and he's about seven o'clock in the morning, first thing in the morning. So I opened the cell up and there was this guy stark naked. He's only about five foot tall, stark naked, baldy head, dripping in blood. It's like somebody had covered him in blood. And what had happened was his cellmate who was in the bunk bed above him had slashed his wrists and bled through the mattress and it had dripped all over him while he was asleep. And, uh, you know, he was just in the bed, collapsed, you know, that guy. But the guy underneath him was covered in blood, banging on the door. So anyway, we, we got him out and I got the hospital staff and they took this guy away. But I assume that they said, oh, he might live yet. Yeah, it depends on how much blood he's lost. But he was certainly slashed to buggery. Uh, but the guy who was covered in blood, I said to him, don't worry about this. You'll be perfectly all right. I said, and from now on, we will know you affectionately as the screaming skull. <laughs> <laughs> he thought that was funny. He said to me, he said, don't worry about me, boss. He said, before I rang the bell, I robbed his backy. <laughs> you know, in other words, he'd gone into the pockets of the guy who'd killed himself and stolen all his tobacco. <laughs> Big Bad Fuds wants to know, do prison guards swear an oath to the queen or the king? Well, you don't. No, no, you don't. But I mean, you do sign on, you know, and take a take, agree that you're going to serve the country and all that. But you don't exactly put your hand on the Bible and swear an oath. They do in the police, but they don't in the prison service. So here's one that goes back to the seventies. Then, did John ever meet John Childs, the assassin who will never ever be released, one of the first to get a full life tariff? I never did meet John Childs, an assassin, no. Well, I don't know if he was in the scrubs. I never met him. Right, we've got from Weston. Were there any prisoners you developed respect or admiration for after your interactions with them? Well, yeah, a number of prisoners. I, I, I believe there was one inmate on... Uh, on C2 landing. I, I went past his cell one day and I saw him drawing. And uh, I said, let me have a look at this, you know. So he showed it me. It was a little cartoon. And uh, I said, you really should be in the art classes. I said, why aren't why in the art classes? He said, uh, he said waste of time asking. He said, you didn't get nothing in here. So I said, leave it with me. So I went to see the art teachers who had a, an office in another part of the prison, told them about this inmate and said, would you consider getting him in the art class? So we got him in the art class and uh, – he did about he had about six months to do, and just towards the end of his sentence, he came to me. He said, uh, I, "I'm applying for jobs now. I'm going to be uh, uh, a cartoonist when I get out." So that's it. so I was pleased for him, you know. Uh, a number of inmates I, I'd met who actually made something of their lives, you know. I said, Gordon Goody, who was one of the uh, train robbers, he got out of prison. He went on to open a bar in Spain, and he, he ran that bar very successfully. In Spain, he was all right, Gordon Goody. I mean, he was a gentleman, you know, he wasn't a fool. That's why I work with the Kersler Trust, who help prisoners rehabilitate through art and writing because there's so much wasted talent in prison, and it's a great way to get them to channel that energy into something positive. So, please support the Kersler Trust. Benny wants to know Was Wandsworth the worst prison? I believe one was with a horrible, stinking pit, but it couldn't have been any worse than Wormwood Scrubs, believe me. I mean, at the Scrubs, they were hosing tramps down with the fire hoses, and uh, it was three to a cell. There were 200 on the landing, uh, in on C2 landing, so it was a massively overcrowded prison. It was also insanitary. There was no 
toilet facilities, inmates will deliberately block up the drains so that there were no facilities at all on the wing. I mean, it was insane. So I don't know if Wandsworth was as bad as that, but certainly uh, the scrubs was bad. Like a boss has asked, John, did you make any friends with prisoners that you ended up totally respecting and becoming lifelong friends with? Listen, uh, it's very difficult to uh, to do that, but as I say, I did help Mark Leach, and uh, I helped him to get his book published, and uh, he went on to be a great success. In fact, the last time I heard from Mark Leach, he was he had a helicopter and he owned a chain of restaurants in Thailand, so I was very pleased for him. He made a, a real success of his life. Uh, a number of uh, another prisoner I knew called Eric. Allison, who is currently and has been for the last 10, 15 years, the crime correspondent for the national newspaper, The Guardian. Uh, he was a prisoner at, at Strange Ways and he went on to write books. In fact, uh, he wrote a book called A Serious Disturbance, which is about the riot at Strange Ways. Because when the riot broke out, the governor went on television and said, there has been a serious disturbance. So the book's called A Serious Disturbance, you see, and I wrote a chapter in that. It's called A Prison Officer's Tale, and you can get that book on Amazon. Uh, Eric Allison went on to be the uh, crime correspondent for The Guardian, and, uh, yeah, he's a success. He's no longer in prison now. He's a, a, a writer. Henry Hemp remembers you as a good prison officer, and he wants to know if you remember Thaka, the prison bully. <laughs> Yeah, I remember. I remember Thacker, yeah. He used to be on G4 landing. And uh, I'll, I'll give you an impersonation of him now. Are you ready? <laughs> Are you sitting comfortably? Hmm? He used to he, When he used to shout out, because he used to slop out, you know, but he didn't shout out G4. He used to shout out E-R, like that e -R, like he was shouting like E-R, you know, like a donkey. Seriously, <laughs> he, had a, he had a big voice as well. But he couldn't fight for bollocks. No chance. <laughs> yeah, tell him. JC wants to know, have you got any advice for current guards from your extensive experience? Get another job. You know, have a look outside and see what else you can do. Because uh, I don't think there's anything that can be done with the current system. You see, as long as the British Prison Service is locking up people for not paying television licences, all, all that the prison system is doing is controlling society. And that's not surely the duty uh, of anybody. What, what it's the duty of God and the duty of the individual. The only thing that prison is really used for is for actually protecting society from people who are dangerous. You can't rehabilitate somebody who doesn't pay the TV license by locking them in strange ways. Okay, so what are your thoughts on conjugal visits in the prison system? Well, you see, if somebody's in prison and they are, are no longer able to cohabit with their wife, gradually the, that, that marriage will break down. So if you allow conjugal visits, what you're doing is you're maintaining a family unit, you're maintaining that connection, so that when at the end of their sentence they are enabled to go out, they still have a functioning marriage. By actually splitting somebody up and moving them all around the country, I mean, they take people from, say, London and send them to Durham. I mean, how are you going to maintain a relationship doing that? And uh, I believe that conjugal visits are one way forward but really, the, the, the people that are locked up in prison, I would say that a good 70% are not there for anything that's serving society. It's a, it's a form of revenge. It's a form of control. You've only got to look at the prisons, and they look obnoxious, horrible things. And that's how they were designed back in the 1850s in the, in the era of Victoria. So I don't believe that uh, prison actually works other than to keep people away from society. That's that's it. So I don't think that conjugal visits would completely work, but they certainly save the marriage and in that respect, yes. JC wants to know if you could also introduce one law, what would it be and why? One law I would make it uh, I make it impossible to imprison anybody 
who is not a danger to society. So if you didn't pay your fines, all right, well, there, there are other ways you can deal with that. You can sequester people's earnings. You can uh, take money out of the bank account. There's ways to do that. But putting them putting somebody into prison for not payment of a fine is nonsense. So I, w I would pass a law that may, would make it an offence to actually imprison anybody who is not sanctioned or sectioned as being a threat to society. And people who don't pay the telephone bills, people who don't pay the TV licence, they're not a threat to society. It's pathetic, isn't it? There's a record amount of women in prison for not paying TV licences. That... what. And to house them costs, what, £60,000 a year? And they've not paid a bloody £200 TV licence. Well, make it, any it, sense. It, it, it makes sense to them because they're, they're making control, yeah? It's, it's their idea of control. I'm in court myself on Friday. For what? Well, not, oh, it's only some speeding offence. <laughs> you know, they said I did 36 miles an hour. So I've just, I, I know, you only send you these forms, you know, and they expect you to fill it all in. How much is your mortgage? How much is it there? I just wrote on it, not guilty, and sent it back. So it's taken them 18 months. But on Friday, I'm at court. But uh, I'm just going to say, produce your evidence. You know, I mean, where's your evidence? You can prove me guilty, get on with it. You know, good, good I'm not, you. I, don't, I don't bother. I'm not bothered. I mean, you can't win. But if they, if, listen, if I've got to pay for the ticket, then believe me, I want to see the show. <laughs> <laughs> King James wants to know, and I, I know you've got lots of stories of, on this subject from personal experience. Are fellow <laughs> officers slow to aid an unliked officer in distress? Didn't the Freemasons pull that on you? Well, I don't know about coming to help you. I mean, they, they bloody set you up. <laughs> <laughs> they send people to actually attack you. They mess you about. I mean, it's dangerous. I mean, they're they're not they're not joking. They have they've got positions to protect, and if you start to threaten that, then you are going to get it. I eventually did. No, Benny, a number of times. Benny wants to know whether you think that sex offenders can be rehabilitated. No. No, I, I absolutely know this is a case because I actually worked with a, a sex offender uh, and a, a famous sex offender, by the way. His name's PJ Proby. He was a famous pop star in the 1960s. In fact, I've got his records here. There you are. PJ Proby, Stage of Fools, yeah. I recorded that. I wrote, wrote songs, you see, and he recorded one of my songs. And I was working with him. We spent quite a lot of money on producing the records and putting them out. And the week before his record was due to come out, he phoned me up and said, John, he's texting, you see, John, I'm going to get married. You come meet my wife. So I went up to his house, and uh, there was a lady there about 45. And I thought, well, oh, nice lady, you know, I shook her hand, said, I believe you're getting married. And probably says, that's not my wife this is my wife and out of the kitchen came an 11 year old girl so he, he was intending to get married to this 11 year old girl and this woman who was was a mother and she was a part of this no so I, I said to her oh right, okay i said well anyway i said I'll tell you what give me a name and address and i'll send you one of jim's new records that are out next week oh that's very kind of you so when I got home, I rang up the duty social services and uh, reported her as being at risk. What the hell? And uh, I, I've since spoken to Proby. I mean, he wouldn't speak to me for a long time. But uh, he still he was in all the papers about two years ago saying how he likes little girls. He oh, liked... what a piece of shit. So, uh, yeah, well, he can't help it, you see. He's mad. It's a, it's a quirk of the mind. What do you think about chemical castration? Well, it's got to beat self. Bloody, I, I, there was a guy at the scrubs who got a razor blade and chopped his tattle off the whole lot and flushed it down the toilet because he said he couldn't be cured. You know, he said he was a sex offender. didn't want to be a sex offender. He said, but there's a mad urge comes through me. He said, I've stopped it now. And did it stop it, the castration? Oh, well, he got nothing to do it with, would he? I mean, the equipment's gone. 
All the equipment. Bloody hell, I thought you meant just his balls. No, 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 he took the whole lot off. Jesus. Um, yeah, so, I mean, chemical castration, I mean, if you haven't got the ability to actually uh, function, then I would say to a certain extent. But uh, the worst one for that was there was a guy at the Scrubs who was, uh, he was interfering with babies. No! Little kids about four, three oh, years old. Oh, come on. He was putting syrup on his dick. Oh no 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 no! I mean, how is that? How are you going to rehabilitate that man? Oh, and I bet he bloody didn't even get a long sentence because the whole system's upside down with these buggers. Yeah, he was doing about three years, I think. That's pathetic. Why do you think pathetic when you think poor old Charlie Bronson has been in there? I don't know how long. Thirty years. That is awful. Shout out to Marvin in the chat. And we've got a question from Stu. When is your book about Strange Ways coming out? The latest book is the same as Psychic Screw other than the first chapter. I see well, we, I've got another one. We've done, we're doing a series of books with John and many people have not come across his work and we have rebranded the first one, HMP Manchester Prison Officer. It's doing phenomenally on Amazon right now. It's got 4.9 stars out of 5, 11 ratings, and I'll just see if there's any of the reviews. Um, a real page turner, skillfully written from Big Daddy. I thoroughly enjoyed reading this book, which is very skillfully written. The author is a master storyteller, and his words paint a very vivid picture of his time as a prison officer. The book is full of interesting characters, some evil, some scary, some funny, some certainly crazy. It's a mixture of many in all those elements. There's not one dull moment in his writing. I can't wait for the next book in the series, which will be published next year. His style reminds me very much of the way David Niven wrote. I would urge anyone to read the biography. There's humor, sadness, happiness, and joy, as well as triumph over adversity. And on and on it goes. There's, there's four of them here. Excellent, excellent story written brilliantly. There's always more to learn. So... John, I mean, you are a best-selling author of, of many years, aren't you? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I wrote for Bloomsbury in uh, 1996. I was in Bloomsbury, and uh, I was sat next to, believe this or not, J.K. Rowling. When, when J.K. Rowling was commissioned by Bloomsbury to write the Harry Potter, the first Harry Potter book, uh, she was commissioned the same week that I was commissioned, and... Uh, J.K. Rowling and I were sat in the offices at uh, Bloomsbury in Soho Square, I believe it is, and uh, the managing editor of Bloomsbury was a guy called, uh, anyway, uh, he said to me, he said, you know, he said, I want to show you to something, and he opened a, cu a, 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 a cupboard, and it was full from bottom to top with all envelopes. I said, well, what is this? He said, those are manuscripts that we get sent in. He said, I employ somebody to take them out and put them back into a, another envelope with a return rejection slip. He said, we haven't got time to read them. So all the people out there who are thinking they can send the books in to Bloomsbury or wherever, and they're going to get read, you know, you I had to piss on your chips, but it, it just definitely ain't going to happen. See, what happened with me was I had a literary agent and Bloomsbury were looking for somebody to write a book and I they picked me to write Psychic Pets. So I wrote the book because I was the feature editor of a newspaper, the, 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 spiritual, the Journal of Spiritualism. I was the feature editor for 27 years, actually. And they needed a, an author to write a book on spooky stuff, so I got the job. But J.K. Rowling uh, was writing uh, Harry Potter, and that was her first book. And she was nothing like she looks today. She was a plump, dowdy little housewife. No, she hadn't got a husband. She got a little baby. And the, the way that she got uh, her money, let me tell you this, she had an agent, and the agent would not sell Bloomsbury the, the world rights. That's America. They wouldn't sell the world rights. They wanted... Uh, Believe this or not, eight hundred pounds they were asking for the world rights to Harry Potter, and they wouldn't. Bloomsbury wouldn't pay it. So seriously, J.K. Rowling kept the world rights, 
And when Harry Potter came out, it was a massive success. And she still owned the world rights. And that's how she became a billionaire. And I didn't. Wow. <laughs> Mark Rushton has said he's currently reading your book and loving it so far. I would urge anybody who's reading it to please leave a review on Amazon. The, link, the Amazon links are in the description box below this video because just like YouTube, Amazon, it's all algorithm based. The more reviews John gets, the more the algorithm promotes the book. The more people buy it, the more reviews it gets and on and on it goes. So it's just getting it that momentum to get it going strong. So I really appreciate all the people who've left reviews for HMP Manchester Prison Officer. If you are reading it or checking it out, please take the time to leave John a review. So we're almost at two hours. So if you've got any final questions, put them in the chat. We've got one from Dave Thomas. I think you've already answered it. Um, what was the worst prison you ever worked in? Well, we're one scrubs, really. But the, 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 I mean, D1 at, at Strange Ways was an insult to humanity, believe me. I mean, if you if you got staff pissing the soup, painting mice, beating prisoners up, kicking them round the floor, that's just about as bad as you get. But the the worst place, I mean, believe me, I know where the full stop is. It's a padded cell in the hospital when you've got your ass full of largactyl. That's the end of the world. <laughs> she wants to know in these series of books, when are you going to be talking about your time in strange ways? Right, well, I'm on the on the next book now. In fact, I was just telling Sean before we came on air that I'm around about 12,000, 13,000 words on the next book, and it's looking as though there's going to be three books because it's just taking my time. I'm telling it just as it happened, and I keep diaries. I got diaries. I'll show you something here. I mean, this is it. You might not have never seen this. Here we are. Can you see this? Actual diary, is it? Oh, HMP Strange Way. Yeah, di a diary. 19, what? 80, 68. 88. 88. 88. No, that, that is the original 88. lightning conductor from the tower. It's a what? That's the lightning conductor. A lightning conductor? Yeah. <laughs> the tower at Strange Ways has got a cast iron lightning conductor. <laughs> And in 1979, it was refurbished, and they took the original lightning conductor down and uh, refurbished it, put a new one up, and that is the top of the original lightning conductor. Because I went up to the top with the actual workmen, because I was in charge of the security detail, and I went up with them. And when they took it down, I said, do you mind? Do you want that? They said, no, no, if you want it, you can have it. They got a big lump. I must smash the end off and gave it to me. There wow. it is. Wow. <laughs> and can you remind people, John, what the name of your YouTube channel is? Tales from the Jails. I mean, if you, anybody wants to really know who John G. Sutton is, type my name into Google. There's loads of stuff out there. John G. Sutton. But Tales from the Jails is my YouTube channel, and I talk about different aspects of the prison. Today I've been talking about the potential release of Charles Bronson, who has just been announced that he's going to have a public hearing for his next parole application. I feel sorry for that guy. I mean, he's a maniac, obviously. But, I mean, the society needs people like that. <laughs> A final question has been slipped in at the last minute by Benny. I think you've answered it earlier on, but, but perhaps you've got something to add. Why did John, a northern man, go all the way down to London to work at the Scrubs? Uh, believe me, I wasn't exactly volunteering for that. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't. I joined at Manchester Prison. I was sent to Lay Hill, which is a training school near Bristol. Uh, and following that, uh, they handed out your details where you were going. And I was posted to Wormwood Scrubs. And that's it. But when you get to Wormwood Scrubs, I mean, it's the bloody middle of London. It, it's near East Acton, North Circular Road, that area, you know. In fact, I'll tell you something. At the top of Duquesne Road, if you turn left and on the, on the opposite, there's some new housing. That is where Rillington Place was. And Rillington Place is where Christie murdered the women and buried them around the house and in the back garden. 
10 Rillington Place. It was right at the top of Duquesne Road, turn left on the other side of the road. I've been there and had a look. It's a spooky place where it was because I when they just knocked it all down. So I actually walked down 10 Rillington, I walked down Rillington Place. Wow. Huge thank you to everyone in the chat. You've made this so interesting tonight with all these different questions. Much appreciated. Massive thank you to John for being so generous with his time. Two nights in a row now. If you didn't see the podcast of him last night, it's got 20,000 views overnight. Check it out. Really gets into detail. But the most detail is in his book, HMP Manchester Prison Officer. Links are in the description box if you're watching this on YouTube. If you're listening to it on Spotify or iTunes, just go on Amazon, put in HMP, Manchester Prison Officer, John G. Sutton, and it will come up. And if you are listening onto the audio platforms, please leave us a review as well about the podcast. And we've got record views right now, listens on the audios, and I've not really asked anyone to leave reviews yet. But if you get a chance, leave us a review. That will be much appreciated. So huge thank you, John. And we look forward to seeing the next part of your series of books and, and reading more. Very good. Thank you very much for inviting me. Cheers. Bye-bye, everyone. Much Bye. love and respect. Bye-bye.